And our reading this morning can be found on page 872 in the Black Pew Bibles, 872. And I brought my glasses today, so I can hopefully see this. Luke 12, our reading this morning, picks up at verse 49. Luke 12, 49. Jesus says this. I came to cast fire on the earth and wood that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father and mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time to come before your word. We do so with humble hearts because we know that we must submit ourselves to your will and to your word. So we pray that you will guide this time as we seek to understand your word and that you will be glorified. Be praised in this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is an interesting passage on first reading, isn't it? After we have we've been going through chapter 12, we've been looking at these ideas that Jesus is telling us that we can trust in Him so we don't have to fear the things of this world. We don't have to fear men because what can man really do to us? Uh, we don't have to fear uh, the finances or provisions in this world. God will take care of us. He knows that we need them. And today as we come to this passage, this is a little bit different and it might catch us off guard. Because if I was to go around and ask you this morning this question, I wonder what your answer would be. The question is this, do you think that Jesus came to give peace on earth? What would we all say? We would say, yes. What do you mean? We we, we talk about that and we celebrate that at Christmas all the time. Jesus is the... Prince of Peace, right? When the angels come and we see them, the shepherds, they say he's going to bring peace, right? Peace on earth to those with whom his pleasure rests, right? We know that Jesus even says in the Sermon on the Mount, that blessed are the peacemakers. In Romans chapter 5, Paul writes, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have this idea that Jesus brings peace. He's going to bring peace. He's the Prince of Peace. And yet, in this moment, Jesus talks to his disciples and he says to them, do you think that I've come to bring peace on earth? Yes, Jesus, we do. And he says, no. Wait a second. What do you mean no? You've been telling us all along who you are and and, and what you've come to do. What do you mean, no, you haven't come to bring peace on earth? You see, one of the things I think Jesus does over and over again is he subverts our thinking. He flips it upside down because he wants us to understand things at, at a different level than we normally do. Because it was pretty commonly held that when Messiah comes, he's going to bring peace. When Messiah comes, he's going to get rid of these people who are bringing persecution to the people of God. He's going to bring in that kingdom that we've been waiting for, that's going to conquer all, that's going to be God's kingdom on earth. What do you mean? You're not here to bring peace. I think Jesus is trying to point to something a little bit deeper in the heart of man. Because, you know, there, there's been times throughout our Bible, uh, times where it should say the end, and they all lived happily ever after, but it just 
doesn't. Right? One of the first places that that seems to happen is in Genesis uh, after uh, Noah's time, where we see that God creates, then sin enters the picture, and there's this, you know, everything's turned upside down. We see the first murder with Cain and Abel, and, and then time goes on, and we see Cain's line and all the stuff that comes out of there. And, but once you start getting to the lists in Genesis chapter 5, we have Noah's father speaks. And Noah's father says, perhaps this one will give us relief. Because all along, generation after generation, the promise that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent, one that would come and that would fix all this mess that has been created because of sin, they were waiting for that promise. And so Noah's father says, maybe he is the one who will bring us relief. And it seems to be that way for a while. And God calls on Noah. He, he makes a special promise with him. He tells them him that he's going to build this ark and God's going to bring punishment all over the world. And after they get off the ark, after evil's been eradicated, so we think, he says to him again what he said in the beginning, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Okay, the end. They did that and it was great. Our Bibles should be like this big. But the problem is, is that even though the outside things look clean, sin was deep down in the heart of Noah and his son still. It remained. So Jesus, I think, in this passage here, he's trying to have us really think, first and foremost, what is peace? What is peace? And if it doesn't reach the point of the heart, where we can have first peace with God, then it's not true peace. I think even before he gets to that verse there in verse 51, where that's the trickier one, it helps us to understand this by looking at the beginning of the passage. So the, the, my first main idea here is uh, what Jesus came to do in each of these main points. The first one is he came to cast fire. That's what he says of himself. Verse 49, I came to cast fire on the earth and wood that it were already kindled. Jesus says, I came to bring fire on this world and I wish it was already blazing. I wish it was already starting and already going. Why? Well, fire is often seen as judgment in our Bibles. That's an easy one. So is he talking about the last judgment when fire then will destroy this world? as water did at one point? Possibly. Fire is also used as a way to talk about purification. Right? When we look at precious metals and we purify them by fire in order to get rid of that which does not belong there, to make it shine better, to make it glow the way it's supposed to. I think either way we look at it, what Jesus is looking forward to is the way the world is supposed to be. Jesus is thinking of forward to when all evil, wickedness, the things that are wrong in this world are made right. And that's a good thing to look forward to. In fact, I think we all should look forward to that. We should sit here and from time to time go, oh Lord, bring that cleansing fire, bring that fire of judgment, because we want this world to be the way it's supposed to be. Because there's too much evil in this world. There's too much wickedness in this world. There's too much hatred in this world. And, and from time to time, it only seems like it gets worse and it depresses us when we turn on the news and we see how people treat one another. How wars continue to happen. How there's hatred that should not exist. And yet that sin still lies deep in the heart of man and so it's still here. So it doesn't matter how technologically advanced we get. It doesn't matter how much superior thought we have than, oh, the people in the ancient times, they're just you know, superstitious people. We're smarter than them. We know better. And yet, do we do any better than the people in the ancient times? Do we treat people any better? Do we love any more? We don't. This world is just as bad as it has always been. In fact, it just travels quicker. 
Now the, the evil in this world can travel a lot quicker than it has in the past. Jesus is looking forward to the good future when God rids this world of sin once and for all. Fire can be destructive, but fire can also be used for good. The same fire that destroys also purifies. And so although Jesus says that he's come to bring fire on the earth, that sounds like a negative thing. Right? That sounds like in this direction where, okay, that's like a bad thing. We know it's necessary, right? We know that judgment must come, but fire on the earth doesn't sound like a good thing. And yet God can use even those types of fires to bring about the good thing. A helpful passage is Malachi. If you want to open your Bibles to the book of Malachi chapter 4. Malachi 4. Malachi is the very last book in your Old Testaments. So if you turn to Matthew and you just turn a few pages backwards, you'll run into Malachi. And in the Black Pew Bibles, this is page 802. 802. As Malachi is prophesying, as he's being God's mouthpiece to the nation, telling God's people that it, it's not about what they merely do on the outside that God cares about. He cares about their hearts. That's how he begins this book. He then looks forward, my Bible has a heading there, to the great day of the Lord. He looks forward to when God again is going to bring about that fire upon the earth. So in uh, Malachi 4 verse 1, the prophet writes this, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. Now pause there. In verses 1 and 2, he says that day is coming, burning like an oven, and it's going to bring destruction to all the evil and wickedness in this world. He says it doesn't leave them root or branch, meaning even deep down to the roots. So you know it when you go out and you use the weed whacker to cut your, your weeds. They're coming back. You've got to get down to the roots. And that's what Malachi is saying here. That's what God does. So even though throughout biblical history, through redemptive history, weeds have been cut like this, but the roots have stayed. So when we see the ups and downs of Israel's history, we know it's because the root of sin has remained. But in this instance, on that day, God is saying, no, 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 we're ripping it from the roots. Nothing's coming back. So that's what happens when that great fire, that, that oven is lit. But what happens now in verse 2? But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be like ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. So the, the same event brings about two different ends. For the wicked, it burns them away. And yet in verse 2, for those who fear the name of the Lord, he says, it's like a son of righteousness. It's not a burning fire that destroys. It's a warm light that brings comfort and joy. As he says, then the people of God go around leaping like calves. I can't leap right now. I can't get very high off the ground. But one day we will all leap like calves. We will be joyful. We will be happy because wickedness is gone once and for all. The way the world was supposed to be will be here. Creation itself groans longing for that day. We too should long for that day. Jesus says he came to cast fire on the earth and I wish it was already going, he says. Why? Because that fire, even though it destroys that which is evil, for those who are in Christ, it purifies and prepares. It purifies and prepares. 
We remember that's what John the Baptist said about Jesus. John said, I come and I baptize you with water, but he who comes after me will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. He will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. And we often try to think, well, what is that fire baptism like? Well, if you turn back in Luke chapter 12, Jesus kind of alludes to that. He says that he has a baptism to be baptized with. But in one sense, Jesus then baptizes us with fire. Baptism, we know, the word literally means baptismo. It means to dip or to put down. That's why we often use it also of somebody uh, in death being put down into the earth, dipped into the earth. That's in Colossians, Paul uses that picture as going being buried with him in baptism and being risen to newness of life. So it's a symbol of what Christ has already did, has already done for us. But to be baptized with fire, we often consider that picture to, all, to, to, to be a follower of Christ going through the trials and pains in life. Going through the trials and pains in life. You see, when you're not a follower of Jesus, those trials and pains are still there. The thing is, is when you're not a follower of Christ, those trials and pains are pointless. But when your faith is in Jesus, when you go through those trials and pains, they are not without purpose. It doesn't mean that we, don't li we like them or anything. We're not crazy. No, but we know that God will use even these negative things to somehow bring about a positive. God uses those trials and pains in order to get rid of whatever's left in us that doesn't belong there. Even if that's lack of trust and faith in Him. So the Apostle Peter writes in his first letter, that when these trials and pains and heartbreaks and traumas come, that it's like fire burning through gold. So our faith, at the end of the day, when Jesus comes, our faith will result in praise and glory and honor. Praise and glory and honor. It reveals the validity of our faith. It reveals, it reveals the reality of our faith. Faith that goes untested is probably not very strong if it's faith at all. But faith that be, is tested by the things in this world, it shows us the validity of it. It shows us that it is true. Jesus came to cast fire. And that fire will destroy evil, but it refines the people of God. In verse 50, Luke 12, verse 50, he goes on and says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Now in Mark chapter 10, verse 38, uh, he connects this. He connects this idea of baptism here that Jesus is going to face with his crucifixion, with the cup that he says he's going to drink. Mark 38 says this, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? So in verse 51, Jesus, is, or sorry, verse 50, Jesus is saying again, I am preparing myself to go through the, the, the tortures of the cross. Jesus is preparing himself to go through that rejection by the Father, that separation that he's going to endure. But at the same time, knowing how hard that is, how unbelievably, beyond anything that we can imagine, how difficult that is for him. Because remember when he's praying? When Jesus is praying in Gethsemane, he prays out, Father, let this cup pass from me. He could have said, let this baptism pass from me, because they're synonymous in this point. Let this cup pass from me, not the cup of your wrath. Because that's what we see throughout the prophets is the cup of God's wrath. That's the cup that Jesus is going to drink for his people. The cup of God's wrath. He says, no, not that cup, but your will be done. But your will be done. The immense difficulty that Jesus is going to go through, he's preparing himself for it, and he says there in verse 50 that he is distressed until it happens. 
meaning he wants this to happen. He needs this to get done because he cares about his people and he wants to make them right with his God. He came here with this very purpose. So we could also say that the fire that Jesus is going to go through brings about the ultimate good for his people. The ultimate good that we could ever imagine, our salvation by grace, was brought through the horrible means of the cross. The ultimate good, our salvation by grace, was brought through the horrible means of the good. So we could, we could ask a question, how can Jesus expect us to go through such things even though they're supposed to bring about good for us? God, how can you want me to go through fire? How come I'm going to be tested? I don't want to be tested in that way. And I think Jesus would say to us, because I did it first. Our God doesn't ask of us anything that he himself hasn't gone through. Because we don't have a Savior that doesn't know what it's like to be us. The book of Hebrews tells us that. He knows in every way what it's like to be a a human except for sin. He knows the temptations. He was tempted in the wilderness. He knows the sorrows. He had friends and loved ones die. He knows the physical uh, difficulties of hunger and thirst. He knows the frailties of the human body because he himself felt pains as they were inflicted upon him. And yet he willingly went through all of that because he knew the purpose at the end of it all. It was not without purpose. The fires that Jesus went through had an ultimate good in the end and the fires that we go through have an ultimate good in the end. Jesus has called us likewise to be baptized, to die to ourselves, and to rise for him to live our lives for his glory. So through sufferings and trials, we as the people of God are being made into something new. Those trials have a purpose. That was something that that in the hospital there was um, a, a moment There was a few different rooms that I was in, I guess. And I don't really remember the first room, but I remember one moment in the first room where there was a song. And I showed it here a few years ago. So you might remember the song. Um, It's called, Though He Slay Me. And it's based off of that passage in Job. And it's it's, it's a great uh, video that's put together because the band sings this song. And in the middle of it, there's a sermon clip from, from John Piper. And uh, in the hospital, I asked Laura, I said, turn that on. And this this is me, I'm loopy, and I'm I'm not really with it. But I say, turn this on. And that song just says, though he he slay me, yet I will praise him. You know, it it doesn't matter what happens to this body. My God is big enough and strong enough and good enough. So I'm going to praise him. And in the middle of that, when Piper comes in and gives that little sermon clip, he says, all the things that happen to us, if you are a follower of Christ, it doesn't matter whether it's criticism or cancer. It's doing something. It's doing something. God doesn't waste anything in the life of his people. We can praise God for that. Because it's not a waste. There's purpose I'm not saying that God brings about these bad things because he is mean or vindictive. But he takes what is wicked and he turns it for good. A few months ago, as I was reading um, some books on the connection between the arts and theology, and I came across a, a painter, I forget his name right now, but a painter who, who studied a, Japanese paintings, techniques and stuff, but he has written some books that... that say how, how we as, as believers can use some of these ideas. Um, and he introduced this idea of, uh, of a, a ceramic bowl that they have in Japan that are broken, but then they are mended with a lacquer mixed with powdered gold. It's called kintsuji. And it's a 500-year-old Japanese tradition where they take these broken bowls and they bring them together with this gold. And you can look up pictures of these. They're really cool. 
And the idea is it, it, well, let me see what I wrote down here. It highlights the imperfections rather than hiding them. Because you could try to bring the bowl together, but this highlights it. You can see the broken lines. But it also teaches us to calm, to calm down when cherished pieces of pottery breaks. It's a reminder of the beauty of human frailty as well. This painter, he says, it's actually a better picture of what God does in our lives. We are broken people that he mends together with gold. And you're going to still see those lines. You can see those lines from time to time, but we are made new. And those bowls, even though they're broken, they're still beautiful. Some might even say they're more beautiful now, having been mended with gold. I thought that's, a, that's kind of what these fires are like. Jesus says fire is going to come upon the earth, a baptism that he's going to be baptized with, going through these troubles and yet coming out in the end as something more, something new. Which then brings us to this question in verse 51. Do you think I've come to give peace on earth? He came to cast fire. He came to be baptized. Third point is he came to divide. <clears throat> and that makes us scratch our head at first. Because the examples he gives are close family examples, division in important family relationships. You go, Jesus, really? Is, is that uh, something that you've come to bring? Now, first we have to mention Christians don't seek this. Right? You don't go to your mother-in-law and say, Jesus says we're going to disagree, so ah, I get to. I don't think that's what he's calling for. But I think he's saying we must be prepared to recognize that the world will want to divide from followers of Christ. The world is going to want to divide from those things that God has said are good. Because in the world, we don't want God. We don't want truth. We want whatever is going to make me personally happy in this moment, not what is ultimately good and true. This is actually a reference Jesus is making to Micah chapter 7. In Micah chapter 7, the idea is that the, the nation of Israel, their, their sin is becoming so influencing of lots of different areas of life that even basic family relationships become destroyed because of sin. But it talks about those who are waiting in spite of that for the righteousness of God to be revealed. While divisions will come because of our faith in Christ, I think we don't have to fear division. We don't have to fear division. And I want to give you just three reasons that I think that this is uh, important as we close here this morning. Fear not division. Because first, division, we are divided from our past lives before we come to know Christ. We are divided from our past lives of sin and this gives us hope that God's work in us is real. If when you become a follower of Christ, you can look around and you can say, my circles have changed. My circles have changed. I no longer am going in this direction, but now I'm going in this direction because God has changed my life. But friends or family who have gone in this direction for so long, now they don't care to be with me because my love now is not for the things of the flesh, but for my God. Division gives us hope that what God has done in our heart is real. The other day I was feeling a little nostalgic and I um, found some... Uh, it was a long time ago now, I don't even know, 15 years ago, I... Uh, was doing this, this web series of episodes. It was a, a little show called Stand Up Guy. And I, uh, I was the, the main character. I, my name was Jeff. And I was a, a, a stand-up comedian, a part-time stand-up comedian is what Jeff would say. And I, in order to make ends meet, my friend and I began working for the mob. Ooh, right? Um, and so we, we, we shot these, these little episodes, and we worked on this for a while. In fact, I wrote part of the first episode, and then we, we ended up doing a few more episodes. And I watched them the other day, and I, it's, it's goofy, you know, when you see yourself doing things you did a while back. But at the same time, I, would, I cringed at myself 
because this was at the same time where God began working on my heart and I started to become a believer. And in those moments, I see myself putting on, you know, doing this, these little mini films, but using the Lord's name in vain. Using, saying, oh God, or Jesus, in a disrespectful way. And I go, oh, I don't like that. And that's coming out of my mouth. And then I started to remember why, what ended up happening, why we didn't continue that. But by the time of the last episode, we were filming it, and I started to become convicted about doing that. And so it was in the script. I mean, before I could make an excuse, I was just in the script. I'm just saying the words written down for me as an actor. But I changed the words in the last script. I wouldn't say that. And people got frustrated with me because I wasn't telling them I just was like, oh, yeah, oh, it says that, okay. And then I would change it when we were filming. But by that time, the whole thing started to peter out because this, our road started to diverge. There was division in the way that we viewed the world and what we thought was important. So it wasn't that we were mean or mad at one another. The people that I was working with, it just ended up not going anymore because God was working in my heart in a different way. Divisions sometimes are a good thing. They help us to see that God is working in our hearts, that we do care more about Him than we care about the things in this world. A second reason we should not fear division. Division shows the distinction between those who are in Christ and those who are not. Division shows that there is a distinction between those who are in Christ and those who are not. Sometimes, again, this takes time. But time being one of the ultimate things shows us, does somebody truly have faith in Christ or not? You know, that was a big thing in, in, in 1 John. When John writes that letter, he's writing to an early church that's coming towards the second century. John gets to write a little bit later. And as they're an early church, first and second generation believers now, what ha- begins to happen is some of the people they call leaders are no longer believing in, in Jesus. They're no longer believing what is true. And the people are going, wait a second, these people are leaving. What happened? They seem to, to really believe. They seem to be really zealous about this stuff. And now they're gone. And if they could be gone, what well, could happen to me? And so John writes to them. And he says, no, no, no. They went out from us because they weren't really ever of us. True followers of Jesus are going to stand fast on the word of God and in their hope in Christ forever. There's going to be ups and downs and difficulties that we're going to struggle with, but ultimately at the end of the day, our hope is going to remain in Christ. At times, these divisions will come to show us the reality of the heart. Third, division is God's grace to spur others to move toward truth. Sometimes division is God's grace to spur others to move towards truth. In our family worship, we were recently reading, well, we're in the book of Romans, we're reading Romans together, and we read Romans chapter 11. And in Romans chapter 11, Paul, as he's been talking about, he's talking about the division between uh, the, the, the Jews, the Hebrews, and the the, the Gentiles. And one of the questions is, if God made these promises to Abraham, why aren't these people believing in Messiah? Paul says, I'm a Hebrew, I'm a Jew, but there's a lot of people who aren't believing in Jesus as the Messiah. He is the Messiah. Why aren't they believing? And so once he gets to chapter 11, one thing he says is, he says, by, well, one, there's a grace of God because the partial hardening of the hearts of the Jews is to bring salvation to the Gentile world. And two, it's because God is showing grace to the Gentiles. I love how Paul says this, to make them jealous. To make them jealous so that they will see there's something going on here. What is happening here? And then that God would bring them also believe in Jesus as Messiah. Division at times is grace to spur others to move towards truth. 
So when the world sees the way that followers of Christ handle tri tribulations and persecutions and traumas and trials, they should see that there is a difference that there is a difference that we go through those fires. Everybody in this world is going to go through those fires. But there's a difference for the people of God. Because the people of God know that there is purpose and ultimately God will bring about good in this situation. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but I'm in this for the long game. I'm in this for the long game. And He will bring about good. We don't need to fear division but trust that Jesus is in control, right? The world is not always going to like uh, followers of Christ because the world wants to be its own savior, its own God. Divisions will come, but we must be prepared to see them for what they really are. Hope for us that our, tr our faith is real. It shows a distinction for those who truly are in Christ and those that we still need to preach the gospel to. Now, I think sometimes when we see that some have divided and separated themselves from the people of God, we can't go, oh, but I know they made a profession of faith at one point. No, we go and we continue to share the gospel with them. But it's also God's grace to bring others towards himself. This is God's word to us. He will keep us and he will sustain us, even if the world divides from us. But that makes it ever more important that we, as the people of God, don't divide, but we stay close together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I praise you for your word. I praise you for this truth that the peace that we seek is not peace the way that the world understands it, but peace the way that you have taught us. Peace first and foremost with you. Peace with our Creator. Peace that causes us to live life in a different way. So help us to seek after true peace, not a peace that simply appeases the sin of the world, but peace that changes the world, beginning in the hearts of men and women everywhere. We praise you, O God. We worship you, knowing that you keep us in the palm of your hand, and we pray that as we see divisions, Lord, that it will help us and cause us to share your truth even more with others who need you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.